Now, as uh, the food crisis increases around the world, scientists have drawn up a list of little-known plants that could be on the menu by 2050. At the moment, 90% of calories are derived from just 15% of crops. So how can we future-proof our diets? Well, you might be munching on this, the pandanus, or pandanus in future, uh, a small tree that grows in the Pacific, uh, it's a pineapple-like fruit, can be eaten raw, and the leaves used to flavour and sweeten dishes. Looks rather nice, doesn't it? Uh, or maybe the cactus pear, sustainable with a high heat tolerance and low water use. Let's get more on this. Uh, joining us live now is Dr. Maribel Soto Gomez, uh, a research fellow at Royal Botanic Gardens Q here in London. Uh, I was quite uh, taken by these, these these numbers. Actually, when you think about the what thousands and thousands, seven thousand edible plants worldwide, and we only eat just over four hundred of them. Well, why is that? Why aren't we growing and exploring more options? I think that just just happened by chance alone. Actually, our ancestors about ten thousand years ago selected a handful of plants to domesticate because. They were appealing. They provided a very good source of food. They, uh, over time, provided good yields, and and they were very good at feeding the world. And that's why they were spread around. And these plants are maize, rice, and wheat. And they're still great crops to to grow and eat. The problem is that if one of them fails, uh, if one of them is not resilient to climate change, then we're going to be in trouble because we rely on them so heavily. And so what we uh, propose is to diversify our food systems to rely on the very broad diversity of edible plants that's out there. But, but how easy will it be to actually scale up the production of some of these foods? I think it, it's very dependent. Uh, so there are about 7,000 edible plants out there and 400 of those are already crops, either main, minor or major crops. And so it's very... Uh, plant specific, whether they're going to be scaled up or not. And something that we have to keep in mind uh, at the forefront is to make sure that the populations that already rely on these plants uh, are still able to access uh, these plants. Okay. And um, for example, I think we only eat one type of banana at, at the moment, don't we? Or, or one or two, but there's something called false banana. What, what, what's that? That's right. So that's uh, already a staple crop in, in Ethiopia. And uh, it's a wonderful crop because it um, it can be used in many different ways. So its foods, its leaves can be used as fiber. But the important part is the underground bit that can be prepared into different kinds of bread. And we know that it's climate resistant. Uh, it's, it's drought tolerant. And um, it, it could provide a very good source of uh, nutrition in many places that have those environmental conditions okay, for and, growing and plants. And I suppose, you know, with the war in Ukraine, you know, we're focusing on, for example, wheat supplies, grain, sunflower oil and everything else. We're not really eating enough beans, are we, either? Legumes. That's right. Well, so they're already uh, legumes are a very important source of uh, high protein for, for vegetarians. And, and I think that they're going to become increasingly important. So the legumes are, there's many, many different legume species that uh, are edible, but we hardly tap into them. And so we're going to be able to, uh, as part of the research at Q, at Royal Botanic Gardens Q, is to identify these uh, other species that we could tap into for, for protein uh, in the legumes. Okay. Uh, all very, very interesting. Uh, Maribel Sotogomez, thank you very much indeed for joining us. That is it.